Hi everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to the Fragrant Bunker. Today we're going to do the top 10 Chanel perfumes for spring. Spring is a particular time of year. It can be cold, it can be warm, it can be hot, it can be very humid, you know, depending which part of the world you're in. So if you're in the northern hemisphere, you're going to have a lot of chlorophyll coming your way and you're going to have those gorgeous green hues and everything is going to be beautiful for a very short period of time when all the plants are at their peak of green and then that's going to kind of slowly you know fade as summer approaches and then we're going to go into those brown hues into autumn but spring is when we have life at its fullest when nature is at its fullest so how do i choose the chanel perfumes to go along with it well first subscribe to my channel here on the tubes you can also join me on um Patreon, Super Deco Ball spelled together there for extra perks. Thank you to my patrons who have pledged. Uh, coincidentally, this video is being filmed live in front of my patrons and my main channel YouTube members. So I am reading the chats on the sidebar. Uh, interesting if, if you guys want to guess which perfumes we're going to have on this list. Now, also, it would be great to know in the comment section down below later on what perfumes uh, you would choose from Chanel for spring. Now, the first one from this family. I have them all in front of me. It's like so beautiful to see them all at once. But the first one is <clears throat> let's get Chanel number five out of the way right away. Uh, it is the Eau de Toilette. Okay. So it's Chanel number five Eau de Toilette. And uh, I've talked about this in the past, but um, I do love the 50 ml refill. This thing is actually meant to be put into a black cartridge. Um, you save a lot of money with this, but it's so beautifully made. Even as a refill, it it's its own bottle. So if I'm traveling and uh, out on the town, I use this one. This is a 20 ml of the Eau de Toilette number five. And you can see it kind of is the same size as the 50 ml. It takes up a lot of space, but you only get 20 milliliter in here. So I think the 50 ml is much better if you're kind of, you know, traveling and doing stuff. Uh, great for taking on the road if you're going to fashion week and you just have it in your purse and you can freshen up. Now, number five in the eau de toilette form is the way to go for me in spring because it is the more floral soothing version or concentration of Chanel number no. five. Yes, every concentration of Chanel number no. five has a different nuance to it. It does smell different. We recognize the DNA of Chanel number no. five, but the Eau de Toilette has a, a fresher, more vibrant accord that suits spring just magically. You know, um, it's not a green scent per se, but if you really, really close your eyes, you can sense out the green in there. Um, You know, even though, of course, it's a floral, powdery accord, it's very, very spring for me. Chanel number no. 5 Eau de Toilette. Of all of the concentrations, this is the best one for spring. In whichever iteration you want it, do you want a 50 ml, 20 ml refillable, the 100 ml non-refillable? There's a 50 ml non-refillable, but it's a little bit bigger than this, so it makes no sense to get that. Plus, it costs more. It makes no sense. Um, now, the second one on my list is Chanel number no. 19, the Eau de Parfum. Okay, now spring has sprung, right? Mm. So I'm kind of wearing this denim combination and I have a denim background. It's, it's very much uh, the vibe of uh, spring. I don't know why, but denim to me always equals spring. It just goes the best with spring for me. So that's why I'm wearing this. And number 19 is one of the best perfumes to spray on denim. I've noticed this. So, of course, this is a green fragrance. Very green. Uh, it is a Chypre. Now, why the Eau de Parfum and not the Eau de Toilette or not the Extreme or uh, number 19 Poudre? Because this one is just slightly warmer than let's say the Eau de Toilette for spring because if you have like April showers or you have that humidity in the air it, it can 
the smell outside can get very... There's a particular type of smell. We're not in the Petrichor area yet, but the smell outside can get quite, uh, I want to say, green in its own right, mossy. So if you layer that with the eau de toilette of number 19, it would become so much more of a dry experience. So the eau de parfum is actually quite good in spring because it counters a little bit that dampness that you get outside. And in fact, it... Um, add some magic to it, you know. Uh, number 19 is beautiful in spring. But the Eau de Parfum gives it that extra oomph, that extra push in spring, you know. The Eau de Parfum has a little bit more of the sweetness to it. It's been created and released in the 90s by Jacques Polge. So the original uh, is Henri Robert's creation from the 70s, but the original was only released as a Parfum and as an Eau de Toilette. So we had to wait all, all, up, all up until the 90s, until Jacques came up with the Eau de Parfum of Chanel number no. 19, which basically, from my understanding of how I smell it, was an attempt by Chanel and Jacques to create a more docile version of Chanel number no. 19, you know, less dry, less detached, because, I mean, of all the Chanel perfumes, number 19 is the one that kind of... gives you that, I don't want to say arrogant in your face, arrogant vibe, but very much I am self-sufficient, I'm independent, don't mess with me, don't talk to me, I don't need you, uh, I am sophistication personified, you know, there's that roughness about Chanel number no. 19, which we all love, or some of us do, I do, but the Eau de Parfum is slightly more tame, you know, it's a little bit less arrogant. And uh, and it's a bit more soapy, fresh, you know, it can kind of counter quite well the humid smell that we can smell sometimes outside if it's raining a lot and, you know, spring can get very humid. So this one counters that humidity very well with that hint of sweetness in it. It's still a very dry perfume. Don't get me wrong. This is not a sweet perfume. But if you compare it to the Parfum and Eau de Toilette, this is the less dry of the three. So that was my number two. Number three is, I think, the epitome of spring when it comes to Chanel. I really do believe so. Uh, because uh, the third perfume is very much... fresh, chlorophyll-filled cut grass with hints of aldehydes, like all Chanel perfumes have aldehydes anyway, but it has hints of oil in it from the grass emanating from within, but it's a it's such a grassy, intense accord. And that would be Bel Respiro. I have the Eau de Toilette concentration and uh, I do prefer it to the Eau de Parfum uh, because just my gosh this is beautiful the Eau de Toilette is uh, so majestic uh, intense it's green it's a promise of okay it's spring but it promises a really cool summer up ahead uh, it's such a joyful fragrance but it's and it's kind of it is green, but there's a balsamic quality to it that uh, gives you almost an ambery touch to the fresh cut green grass. So there's an acidity level there that uh, almost has a patchouli-esque type of quality to it while at the same time remaining fresh, very, very, um, by fresh, I don't mean, you know, those classical fresh smelling citrusy fragrances. This is not one of them. By fresh, I mean envision a garden where the plants are at their ripest peak, again, filled with chlorophyll, and uh, that green is just so amazing. But there's also kind of a 
honeyed ambery accord lurking in the background. That's the promise of summer that I was talking about before. And, and sometimes it can go so intense into that honeyed memory accord that it almost turns pissy uh, in a way. It, it has an aggressive nuance to it, and it's just so beautiful. The Eau de Toilette, this is one of the first formulations ever made in, in the late 2000s that I own. It's a bottle a uh, batch code 8901. You know, they repeat every eight to nine years. And this one has matured like a fine wine. It, it's just uh, the depth of it is uh, is majestic. It really, really takes you to a place you've never been before because Bel Respiro, you know, there's no other perfume out there like it, really. Now, in the current state and formulation of the Eau de Parfum, it, it's 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 become watered down a little bit cheaper the ingredients smell combined together a little bit more of detergent and bathroom you know it's still better than a lot of perfumes out there but nothing compared to the auto toilette this thing is just a masterpiece really and very underrated very very underrated tipa says earthy then it does have an earthy quality it's like green and earth it's beautiful. Very unique. That's right, Aisha. It's very, very unique. Gorgeous. Um, the next one is another Les Exclusives fragrance and another one that I just um, adore. I've been, I went through, gosh, I can't even remember, I think four bottles of this one already, and it is just the most beautiful perfume for late spring, okay? This is already the time when summer is kind of already showing its face, right? That one would be La Pausa, okay? And La Pausa is the Eau de Parfum concentration. For those of you who don't know, before... Um, Olivier Polge released the entire Les Exclusives range as Eau de Parfums and the Eau de Toilettes were discontinued. La Pausa had a different name. The Eau de Toilette version of La Pausa was called 28 La Pausa, which is um, just like Bel Respiro, by the way. Let's go back to Bel Respiro for a second. Bel Respiro is also uh, coincidentally the name of one of Ch Coco Chanel's villas or little kind of retreats that she had uh, in the south of Spain where she would kind of just evade and relax a little bit. That was Bel Respiro. La Pausa is the same, just a different address, a different part of France. And 28 La Pausa is the address of the house, of the house La Pausa. They took out uh, the 28 number, which used to be at the top. So 28 La Pausa is a toilette. La Pausa, without the 28, is the Eau de Parfum. It is different to the Eau de Toilette, but this is one of those rare instances of the Les Exclusives fragrances where I say, you know what, they did it a lot of good uh, changing the concentration on this one. I love 28 La Pausa, but I also love La Pausa. I almost treat them as two different perfumes, really. Um, this is Oris Root and Iris Galore in the most dry and sophisticated way ever. And it, uh, iris and oris root, but it doesn't go much powdery like you would envision, let's say, perfumes like Dior Homme Original. You know, it has that very makeup y, powdery accord of iris. No, this one is more oris root than iris. It has um, a dry. It has almost a chalky, like chalk like a chalky accord. Uh, it's like a very white, powdery orris root that is slightly tinted with a hint of rose or beige colors, but it is it is almost white as chalk. Coincidentally, I often think of the color white when I smell this, and... Um, you know, uh, this could have been called white, like Chanel's white color. Um, this could have been called the white camellia. Uh, 
I know camellias technically don't have smells. Some do, but most camellias, well, the camellia japonica that uh, Chanel loved so much does not have a smell. This could be a very interesting smell for a white flower that usually doesn't have a smell. So white camellia, this could be a beautiful camellia fragrance. Fabulous. Um, so uh, Jesus is saying in the chat, it's very much inspired by Serge Luton, Iris Silver Mist by Christopher Sheldrake. So let's talk about this for a second. Uh, Jesus mentioned that in the chats. Um, so Christopher, Shel Christopher Sheldrake was hired by Chanel to work with uh, Jacques Polge together. However, Jacques Polge gets the most, if not all the credit for all the perfumes, but Sheldrake was in the background delivering kind of most of the magic, really. And uh, and yes, Sheldrake was also working for Serge Luton, and a lot of his creations for Serge Luton have been reinvented for the Les Exclusives range. Now, people have been talking about this since years. It, it almost is as if every fragrance from uh, the Les Exclusives range minus the ones made by um, in the 20s by Ernest Beau, that they have a counterpart within the Serge Luton's fragrances that Sheldrake made for Serge Luton. And some people say, well, it's, it's copying, it's copying. The way I see it is that um, if the same artist, the same perfumer, takes his own formulas, because Christopher Sheldrake did the perfumes for Serge Luton, if he takes his own formulas and re-envisions them for another house and makes them smell adapts the smell to adapt it to the other house, in this case, to Chanel, that's legit for me. That's okay. You can do that. If you're the artist and you're saying, I want to re I want to redo the perfumes I've done before, but I want to reinvent them, almost give them another outfit and dress them up for this other brand. I want to give these Serge Luton perfumes a Chanel outfit. And I think that the job that uh, Sheldrake did together with Jacques Polge was is magnificent, really, because I do love La Pausa and uh, very much so. Audrey says, uh, Sheldrake forever, true artist. Yes, we, we do love Christopher Sheldrake a lot here uh, in the Fragrant Bunker. We do. Um, so, so there's that. Uh, so bear that in mind. And yes, more and more people are becoming aware of this, that there's a lot of similarities between a lot of the Les Exclusives fragrances and, and Serge Luton fragrances. Uh, it's not a big secret. Nobody's trying to deny it. The same perfumer worked on both lines. Sheldrake worked on Serge Luton and Sheldrake worked on, on Chanel. So there you have it, you know, it kind of, it, it, it almost makes sense, you know, when you're when you're bringing your own formulas and your own vision into another perfume house. Of course, you're going to have your signature scent. Jacques Cavalier is is doing the perfumes for Louis Vuitton, but Jacques Cavalier has a signature rose that we know from Classique already from the '90s, and we have that accord in all of the Louis Vuitton fragrances as well. You know, it's every perfumer has their own special formulas, and Sheldrake definitely left his. You know, it's almost as if he he said, well, I might not get all the credit. It's going to be Jacques Polge's name everywhere, first and foremost, and then my name. But you're, but if you know perfumes, you're going to be able to smell out my signature in, in the Les Exclusives range. And and we do. We do smell out the, 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 the Sheldrake signature. Now, uh, the next one uh, is... Uh, for the Petrachor moments, okay? So this is, for Chanel standards, a brand new line. I mean, considering that Chanel perfumes have been existing since over 100 years now, this is the, the latest range of perfumes in the Chanel family, and that would be the Les Eaux de Chanel. And so my next perfume, which would be my fifth perfume, is Paris Edinburgh or Paris Edinburgh. So this thing is gorgeous. It is a cypressy green accord that smells of petrichor. Petrichor to me smells like petrichor. Olivier Paul just behind this perfume. Petrichor is a smell that you get um, if you smell after several days of dry 
weather, uh, it rains, and that rain wettens the soil and the bacteria in the soil. And the bacteria have a smell, actually, combined with earthy, soily smell and leaves and what have you and grass. That's petrichor. Okay. And usually quite intense in summer. Uh, but uh, you can also feel it in spring. And paracetamol is beautiful in spring because it gives you more of a wet nuance of petrichor. If you spray it in summer, it's going to give you a drier sensation of petrichor, but it's it's quite a damp and wet version of petrichor. It's, it, it hints at sweetness, but it's a gorgeous little green fragrance. Han says, have it, love it, <laughs> Edinburgh, right? It's a gorgeous, yeah. Yeah, like a smell after rain or under a waterfall. Yes, T-Pal, that's the vibe. That's the vibe. That's the vibe of Paris Edinburgh. So it's really, really, really nice to wear in spring. It it elevates your mood. It's sweet just the right amount. It has that powdery sweetness. The aldehydes are a little bit more toned down. It does sparkle. Every Chanel perfume has those bubbly aldehydes in the top notes, so it does sparkle. But it, it's a gorgeous perfume. Very well blended, very well balanced. Really, really nice. I'm not so sure if Sheldrake is working on the Lazoos as well. I don't think he's working with Chanel anymore. I might be wrong, though. Let me know in the comment section down below if Sheldrake is working with Olivier Polge on the Lazoos as well. The uh, next one on my list is, uh, I want to say, the driest of all of these. Okay. This is the one to wear in, I want to say, 3 p.m. onwards to a spring late lunch, brunch, lunch with friends, even for business. Not something for the office. I would not recommend this in the office, but I would definitely recommend this when you're out and about and you want to give that sophisticated vibe to everybody around you. Uh, and that would be Cristal Eau de Toilette by Chanel. Okay, so this one goes through continuous uh, difficulties to source because, um, you know, Chanel keeps kind of producing small quantities of this one, then it sells out, then for like half a year it's sold out on their website, you can't get it, you can't get it. They've discontinued the 60 mil version, so all that's left is the 100 ml of the Eau de Toilette and the 100 ml of the Eau de Parfum. It is a beautiful, beautiful Chypre. It is crystalline. It is dry as a mofo. I mean, this thing is like somewhere else on another level. And it can suffocate you if you overuse it in a in an office environment. I remember once when I did have an office job, uh, people, the day that I wore this, people were like not having it. <laughs> they were not having this bitter Chypre in their presence. Not at all. Henri Robert is the nose behind the Eau de Toilette. And uh, this is the last perfume. It was released after Coco Chanel passed away, but... It's already been worked on and developed during her lifetime, and uh, it is a really an ode to the last years of Coco Chanel by Henri Robert. It's like kind of his way of portraying her. You know, she was in a difficult position towards the end of her life with, with uh, struggling with the morphine addiction, with all the pain that she was having, and she was always alone and scared to be alone and she had her tantrums and there was a lot going on in her life and she had moments when she was very bitter so and she was a chain smoker so there's this ashtray accord in this perfume as well and there's this bitterness and this kind of cramped holding on to life but being angry at all the missed opportunities as well when it comes to you know passion and life and love this perfume has it all uh, so it is a very very emotional fragrance it is uh there's sadness in here you guys maybe this is one of the reasons why i can only wear this in spring because spring is like so such a promise of life that it's the only thing that i can deal with like i i have the life that helps me get through the depressive phase of, of Cristal because like to wear this in deep winter, you know, it can be really difficult 
it can be painful. <laughs> it can be painful. But so it's nice to have contrasts, to have like spring life all around you. And then you have this to weigh it down. You know, it's all about the balance. It's always about the balance. So this one is gorgeous in, in spring. Yeah, it is an ashtray. So Kev says ashtray sounds pretty amazing. Yeah. Dry as an ashtray. Now, the next one is uh, really beautiful in spring, but you got to like your synthetics, okay? This is a musky, 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 musky one. So there's a lot of musk in this one. Uh, I forgot, five or seven different musks. And uh, it's a relatively new Chanel Les Exclusives fragrance, and that would be this one right here. It is 1957. The Eau de Parfum by Olivier Polge. Musk, 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 and honey. It's like a honey musk moment. Um, it's very... I don't know why, but this to me is the perfume I like to wear when I go to the movies in spring. Don't ask me why. I Just don't ask me why. I don't know. For the love of me, I don't know why. But this, to me, is perfect for going to the movies in spring. Does that make any sense? Absolutely no sense at all. But it, it's giving me movie vibes. Oh, Aisha says, oh, I love this one. Oh, please and fruit gummy. Does it go well with popcorn? Oh, hell yeah. Yes, it does. It goes really well with salty popcorn and jalapenos. <laughs> it really does. I don't know why. It's, I guess, the mood of the cinema, the darkness of it, you know, that huge room you enter and then there's a projection in front of you and it, it, it fills the space very nicely. These synthetic musks are very, very interesting for cinema. I, I don't know why, but it always, like... If I'm in a pinch and I'm going to the movies last minute decision and uh, with friends or whatever, and I'm just like, oh, what perfume do I grab? I usually grab this one and I spray it on. I don't know why. But it's also not a perfume that annoys people around you that much, you know? So it, it's, you know what I mean? It's not a heavy one that's going to make everybody around you go, oh, gosh, here we go. I want to spend two or three hours at the movies, have some fun. But instead, I'm kind of spending my time trying to survive the smell of a really, really heavy perfume. No, this is not it. It does have character. I mean, it's strong enough, but it's subdued just enough to make it kind of like um, a muskier version of Boy, another perfume by Chanel, which coincidentally is the next one on my list. So Boy came out in 2016 when the Les Exclusives perfumes shifted from Eau de Toilette to Eau de Parfum. The Eau de Toilettes were discontinued and then they were reintroduced as Eau de Parfums. Boy was the first Les Exclusives perfume to be launched only as Eau de Parfum. So there are no iterations of Boy uh, as Eau de Toilette. Okay, o Boy has been an Eau de Parfum from the beginning. I have the first formulation of it. I got this bottle when it was first launched. Um, in Paris, only Paris had it at the beginning. And um, it's aged beautifully, but it's not my favorite perfume. Now, because it's so similar to 1957, it is also in the spring Chanel perfumes list. But it's not one I gravitate towards often. I don't know. Um, to me, this one just doesn't have enough character. Uh, it's okay. It's pleasant, inoffensive, simple perfume, easygoing. Um, but it doesn't give me that extra touch of character that 1957 delivers. You know, I almost feel like 1957 is a better version of boy so kind of a missed opportunity there but anyway for those of you who love boy and i know a lot of people love boy it's an okay perfume it just doesn't tickle my pickle you know what i mean but i put it in this list because it's also very 
spring-like. You know, it, it suits the atmosphere of spring, especially early mornings if you're going to work and you're walking through nature or what have you, or through a park, through the city. This is beautiful for those mornings. It's a morning type of fragrance. It's like, the, I know that like Chanel likes to describe it as wearing a fresh white uh, just ironed shirt, linen or cotton shirt, and it just smells so clean, like, you know, your boyfriend's shirt, your husband's shirt, your lover's shirt or whatever, or your own shirt that's just been washed for you. Uh, so it's kind, of, it's kind of the beginning of the day when you're still clean and fresh, freshly shaved. It's okay, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't give me life like the other ones do. But it's very spring morning. Yeah. It's very spring morning. The next one uh, is... Uh, believe it or not, this one, even though it's very much close to the water, uh, it still has quite <clears throat> a city vibe. So it's almost like in spring you're experiencing daydreaming and you're wishing that summer would come so you could go on a holiday and you're dreaming of going to the seaside but you are in the city and this perfume is a perfect combination of the of the two it's like it smells of city but also of the sea okay and that would be paris riviera from the lezu range It's very much the city giving its interpretation of what the Riviera would be, what the seaside Riviera would be like. Uh, very much that. It's giving me totally those vibes. And so you kind of start thinking about going to the water in spring and in summer when days start getting warmer. You know, it's not like your first thought goes to the seaside in winter. Um, but spring is when you start thinking, hey, you know what, maybe if there's a nice weekend, like, you know, you get a long weekend, several days off work, and you want to drive somewhere to some seaside ocean or lake or something, you start getting those thoughts in spring. And this is kind of how this smells like, like a city person dreaming of going to water. <laughs> that's the smell of it. So, and this type of thought comes to mind in spring, and that's why this one is perfect for spring. Debbie, you guessed it. Yeah, Riviera, just a lucky guess. Yep. Kev says, I prefer boy for spring summer, but never fall winter. Yeah, Riviera, it's so fascinating. It's kind of this Neroli uh, based fragrance that. Um, is subtle, it has a delicate nuance to it. And again, a crowd pleaser, you know, you can wear this to the office, people are not going to hate on you. It's not intoxicating, it's it's very subtle, but obviously the Lezou range is a subtle range. I mean, they were originally, allegedly conceived as Eau de Cologne's, but then Chanel apparently, you know, decided last minute to call them auto toilettes, I guess, to be able to charge more. Uh, and they do cost a lot, especially after the latest price increases. I mean, the prices really become insane for these as well. Even though they still cost way less than the Liz exclusives, but still, like, they've gone quite considerably up in price. So that would be Paris Riviera. A city slicker thinking about the seaside. Uh, no, I don't detect the orange. The it's no, no tipal. No, no, it's not like orange blossom. I don't detect that in here. And uh, that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, we're down to our last one, the tenth Chanel fragrance for spring. I don't think anybody guessed thus far. This is, I think, the least known of the readily available Chanel perfumes. I think it's one of those least purchased, perhaps. 
Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't see many people wear this one. I also don't see many people talk about this one, but this is really, really beautiful in spring. And that would be hmm, number 18, Chanel. I do have the Eau de Toilette concentration here, not the Eau de Parfum. Um, I have several bottles of this stocked up before, you know, when it got discontinued, I purchased another 200 ml bottle and another 75 ml bottle. They're kind of packed away because I want to, you know, keep them safe. Uh, so this is a potpourri fragrance. It is so beautiful for picnics uh, in the park for, you know, your Easter moment, uh, hunting eggs and having a picnic in the green or in a barn, wherever you want to go, but just being in nature. So apparently the story wants it that Chanel uh, has distilled its own brandy for number 18. So there's a very particular brandy accord in the opening notes. And then we dive into a beautiful floral bouquet, but in potpourri form. So it's like dried fruits and flowers. That's a potpourri, but drenched in brandy. Uh, the brandy is a clear type of brandy, uh, and it it's boozy but sweet. You want to drink it. I think if Patsy Stone had a choice from Ab Fab, like which Chanel perfume to drink, yes, we've seen her drink Chanel Number no. Five in the show because Chanel Number no. Five is so iconic. But if Patsy Stone really existed and really had a choice which perfume from Chanel to drink, I think she would go for Chanel Number no. Eighteen because I mean. It's a beautifully balanced brandy accord. Um, it's great for the palate. It's a great palate cleanser. Uh, this is something to, to wear to a special dinner out uh, in nature, you know? It just... Uh, <clears throat> it screams nature, but it also screams of humans managing to tame nature for their own purposes, like creating really sophisticated, luxurious digestives or digestives or alcohols, grappas, brandies, cognacs, you know, like when humans manage to tame nature and produce drinks or foods that are very elegant, very expensive because rare, because the distillery needs special products or not a lot of time to create this particular type of brandy. So this feels like, to me, honestly, if you have to compare it to also food from the entire Les Exclusives range, this would be the caviar. You know, it doesn't smell fishy. Don't think about the flavor of caviar, but think about the rarity and how certain caviars are really expensive. Um, this is kind of of the collection. This is the the one that takes most time to acknowledge. Uh, this is the one that takes you most time to really consider buying, you know, because it is its own thing. And uh, there's subtlety there. Now, the current version that is available for purchase, which is the Eau de Parfum, it's, it's okay. It's okay. But something about the Eau de Toilette gives you that cool, cold touch that a good brandy has that the Eau de Parfum doesn't really deliver. The Eau de Parfum is much warmer. You see, this is more cold. There, there's a cooler note to the Eau de Toilette of number 18, which is just divine. Mm. Yes, Jesus says uh, Ambret Musk is uh, the main note uh, in number 18, one of Jesus's faves. The Ambret uh, Musk is a it's a it's a different accord than what you would find in 1957, right? This is a different type of musk. So don't think that we were talking about musks here that they're similar they're not. They come from two different families. I mean, you can smell out that they're both Chanel, but they're very modern day Chanel. You know, this is a very, very modern Chanel. Actually, interesting that all three of them fall into spring, the Chanel spring, right? The reinvention of the Chanel brand, because these three, boy, 1957, 
and 18 are kind of the future of Chanel. You know, this is where Chanel, this is the direction Chanel is going to. Uh, and these would be my top 10. Now, coincidentally, you know, uh, Chanel is just about to launch a brand new Les Exclusives perfume in 2023. One does wonder in which direction it's going to go. Is it going to go in the direction of, of these? You know, 57, boy, and number 18? Or are we going to go into warmer territories like uh, Le Lyon de Chanel has been, which was the last launch by Chanel several years ago from the Les Exclusives range? Coco Kitty says 1957 is like honeycomb and cashmere. Uh, Jesus says 1957 is synthetic clean musks. But Ambret is actually a natural plant musk, which I'm not quite sure if they use the natural plant musk in number 18 or if they went synthetic there as well. It does give you a vibe of you know how they say, well, it's actually the wooden barrels that contain the alcohol that give the alcohol ultimately its true flavor. How acidic is the wood uh, that the barrels are made of? What wood are the barrels made of? How old is the wood that the barrels are made of? How many different alcohols, uh, how many times did you do your brandy inside that one barrel? How many years has it been used? You know, it develops its own patina. It develops its own flavor and it adds flavor to the brandy as well. It's very important, very, very important where you let your alcohol ripen. So it almost feels like... Um, Number 18, in this particular concentration that I have, it gives me a humongous amount of the smell that you have when you do go to these distilleries and they do have these aging brandies somewhere in the corner. And sometimes if you get to smell the inside of the barrel, uh, that, you know, that type of residue that's on the walls of the barrel, that's what this smells of. It, it smells of the barrel that's containing uh, the, the alcohol in it. You know, it has that particular type of humidity about it, that particular type of woody, woodsy, brandy accord. It's just div divine, really. It's really delicious. Jesus asks, how ripe is the wood? You know, the wood is always ripe. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know what your top 10 for spring would be and what your thoughts are on my selection uh, of this uh, cute little spring Chanel perfume journey. I hope you like this video. If you have, please do thumb it up and subscribe. Until next time, never give up on love. Bye.